tool. Uh, so basically the title says the, the, uh, the protective role of the vagus in uh, diseases. And I made a game of words in Hebrew. Um, so it's difficult to translate the second part. Um, I have to say that I got to this whole topic because of a student's question. And that's the nice thing about it. Uh, in the middle of a class in England, when I was heading in the master's program in health psychology, uh, a student asked me with her cute British accent. Uh, she said, uh, Yori, how does the brain know that we have cancer? Uh, and I looked at her and I said, uh, I don't know. Uh, and we're talking about very, very small cells when it's not even big and does not hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I reached to London to a very good library and I found something about the vagus. I did not know anything about this nerve. And uh, for about 50 hours, I did not sleep and that's how it started. So in my first paper, I actually mentioned her name and I thank her for her question. So uh, unlike what we think from the media, we're not dying mostly from Corona. We're actually, people are dying from other diseases, as you all know, from stroke, heart disease, cancer, and breathing, uh, chronic breathing diseases, COPD. Uh, when you add to this also disabilities, so you also get chronic pain and depression and anxiety, of course. Um, many of these diseases, although they are different, they have a lot of common things, uh, smoking, uh, insufficient exercise and uh, un uh, unhealthy diet. By the way, the exercise is a very strong predictor of lower risk, really strong predictor also of cancer, of less risk of cancer, between 20 to 60% reduction if we do sufficient exercise. Now the question is, is there one factor or can there be one factor? Can we even imagine one factor that could actually predict a lower risk of these diseases, all of these diseases that is related to a healthier lifestyle and with, at, which at the biological level actually blocks these blocks biological factors that cause these diseases, heart disease, cancer, um, COPD, et cetera, and stroke. And if so, we should be measuring this factor and we should try to increase its activity. So with all uh, modesty, I would like to propose that this might be the vagal nerve. So the vagus is mostly parasympathetic. It's mostly, it's a major part of the parasympathetic nerve system. And usually they work in opposition to each other. As you all know, the sympathetic response is our fear and fight and flight accelerating the heart, constricting blood vessels, whereas the, the vagus does the opposite. It slows down the heart rate and widens the uh, blood vessels. This is the, our, our fellow. The vagal nerve in, innervates um, multiple uh, organs. Um, I call this in Hebrew, I call it Moami uh, Wushalmi. Gets to a lot of these organs, to the, to the vital organs to the lungs, to the heart, to the uh, liver, etc. 80% of its uh, branches go up. So it's an information highway informing the brain about multiple, multiple signals. Uh, and not only the barrel reflex, not only about blood pressure, but about um, uh, the microbiota, which is now getting huge importance in research uh, about inflammation, about the uh, eating, and I will show you that soon. 20% of the fibers go down, modulate. We measure its activity by what's called heart rate variability, HRV. So I call the, the, the vagus the accordionist, the guy who's playing the accordion on the ECG. So this is of course a bit exaggerated picture, but we're, you can see the differences in the intervals. Now these are normal heart rates, it's not arrhythmia. I'm talking about normal heart rates where the interval is changing. Narrow, wide, narrow, narrow, wide, okay? And the, this variability, heart rate variability, HIV, is strongly, profoundly correlated with actual vagal activity, and it's causal. Because if you give these, these were in mice, I think, if you give them a vagal drug, the HIV goes up. And I'll just say that there are many kinds of parameters of HIV. There's mostly time domain and frequency domain. In my research, research we're focusing mostly on time domain, but we're gonna be doing studies also on frequency domain. So in frequency re refers to at which frequency does this variability take, take place? And most of it is also vagal. 
I'm going to show you that uh, the vagus is also crucial in our resilience. So in Israel, we're very interested in resilience. And now in the world, people are more interested in resilience because of the COVID. And resilience re refers to your ability to re react to stress, but also recover from it. So this is a study that they stress students. It's not so difficult to do. And they, um, uh, forgive my humor, and they, uh, they measured their level of HIV before the study. So they split the sample into high and low HIV. What's interesting about the study is that they looked at three different systems, cardiac, diastolic blood pressure, hormonal, cortisol, and immune inflammation. And this is what they found. So you can see that looking at blood pressure, this is before the stressor, two stressors, and an hour later. Everybody goes up and then goes down. People respond. But the ones who recover faster are the ones with higher vagal activity. So the vagus determines our speed of recovery from stress at the biological level. This is blood pressure, this is cortisol, and this is inflammation. In fact, the ones with low recovery, with low HIV do not even recover hardly. They, they do a bit, but not enough. And the ones with high HIV even get better than before. This is crucial because inflammation is the mother and father of almost all chronic diseases. Julian Taylor in a meta-analysis found which regions in the brain correspond to vagal activity. Surprisingly, it's amygdala also, which is really crucial in fear and threat, but more so in frontal activity. So HIV is positively correlated with these regions that are crucial in emotional regulation and that are crucial in decision-making. And we know that in mental health today, it's much more important the capacity for emotional regulation than what we used to think about emotional expression and all that romanticism about that. The key for mental health, and we can help people today so much faster and so much more efficiently by teaching them emotional regulation skills. And the Vegas plays a very important role in that because it activates these frontal regions, which tell the amygdala, it's okay, it's over. The siren is not here, the line is gone. And that's what we need to teach people with depression and anxiety. This is a study that I did with a Japanese colleague, uh, Hideki Ohira. He was a specialist, a world specialist on neuroimmunology and which regions in the brain correspond to the immune system. And I said to him, why don't you reanalyze your data and split it into high and low HRV. And I think that the brain regions that correlate with your with immunity will be different in high and low HIV in people with good vagal activity and people with bad vagal activity. And in fact, the results were stronger than what we thought. So in people with lower HIV, these were Japanese students that were stressed. It's even easier to stress Japanese students. And in those students, uh, uh, there was no correspondence between the brain and the peripheral factors if their HIV was low. If their vagal activity was high, the brain and the immunity were synchronized. That was incredible. So the vagus determines the strength and the magnitude of synchrony between the brain and the peripheral immunity and the peripheral uh, hormonal system. So, and it was in very interesting regions in the cerebellum, which is not only important in your walking and gait, but also in cognition and breathing. And it was important in singulate, which is really crucial in decision-making and in sorry, in, in emotional regulation and in cardiovascular regulation and in attention switching. More importantly, we know that the connectivity between the frontal lobe and amygdala is crucial in many mental diseases. This connectivity is not enough. There's not enough regulation of the amygdala. This degree of connectivity is positively correlated with HRV, okay, higher base, Nine HRV, more frontal to amygdala connectivity. This is the most important study that I've ever found in the last 10 years. This is a study where they took 44 depressed people and they measured their MRI. They're measuring the brain activity, sorry, with MRI, but they also measured inflammation and anxiety. Again, this connectivity between a frontal region, which is very important in vagal activity and in reducing depression and hopelessness, this VMPFC, the more connected to the amygdala, not only they had less anxiety, they even had less inflammation. 
So this connectivity, which is crucial in vagal activity and crucial in emotional regulation, is also crucial in inflammation regulation. That's unbelievable. This is all of the domain of neuroimmunology and psychoneuroimmunology in one slide. It's not my study, it's somebody else's, it's amazing. I contacted them and I said, let's collaborate. Let's see if we can activate the vagus and cause this. And they asked me in their email, they replied, do you have money? So that was a bit of a funny, a cynical uh, reply. So um, uh, to summarize my first part of the talk, I call the vagus our pagoda. And I'll explain. In Japan, there are many, many earthquakes. And after the earthquakes, they realized that a lot of the buildings collapsed, but in the towns and cities where the buildings did not collapse, it was the pagoda that stayed, mostly. And the, then they discovered why. The pagoda has a central beam, very strong, but it's not the beam that's important. It's the fact that the building around it rotates during the earthquake, and then it comes back to the middle. Just like the, uh, the palm tree that can bend from the wind, that's the palm tree that will not break. The vagus enables us to do this flexibility biologically and psychologically. And so people with higher vagal activity will be more resilient because they can swift and change and be open to changes at the biological and psychological level. So going back to the global burden of diseases, stroke, heart disease, cancer, and COPD. So I'm gonna walk with you in three levels. The first one is epidemiological. Does HIV predict these diseases, a lower risk of these diseases? And the answer is yes. It's strange, it predicts almost every chronic disease, lower risk of these diseases. So this is a study done on soldiers, which is relevant to our country. These were, I think, American soldiers, 75 of them, they were, they were injured and they were brought in helicopter to hospital. And some of them had uh, surgery, some of them had resuscitation, and some unfortunately died, and some went home to their mother and father. In the helicopter, on the way to the hospital, they measured many, many parameters, including vagal activity, HIV. In a multivariate analysis, the only thing that predicted what happened to these soldiers was HIV. Now, I'm not saying that it's always the most important thing. I'm not saying that. But it's not surprising when we understand that the vagus innervates so many organs and modulates cardiovascular, immune, respiratory, uh, uh, hormonal systems, we can understand why it emerged as a crucial predictor of what happened to these soldiers. What about the metabolic syndrome? Obesity, hypertension, diabetes. It's an outcome on its own and it's a predictor of high risk of heart disease and cancer. The higher your HIV is, not only do you have less of metabolic syndrome, you have less of its components. And indeed in diabetes, a meta-analysis of 25 studies showed lower HIV in diabetes. What about heart disease? Many studies show that high, high vagal activity predicts low risk of a heart attack. And more importantly, after a heart attack, 21 studies found four times the chance of living if your HIV was high. And this was published in the number one journal of cardiology not in a side journal, in the number one journal of cardiology, higher HIV, four times the risk of uh, living. I promise you that the people upstairs from where we are in uh, public health, if their relative risk is two, they're happy. If it's 2.6, they throw a party. But here, the average was four. And still, it's not being measured routinely. I don't know why, okay? So these things move very slowly. It's already more than 10 years ago, still HIV is not routinely measured. And in fact, the ignorance is incredible. Some doctors think that HIV is an artifact, imagine. They think that these changes are its noise, some doctors. I heard about this in Rambam, I, I didn't know where to begin, yes. Of course, most doctors know about it, but some, some just don't get it. What about cancer? So this is a review that we did in Belgium. You can see that this review I did not do. These are Chinese colleagues. And uh, HIV is a predictor of longer survival in cancer. In fact, there are three reviews out there showing that. So these are our results in Belgium. 
higher vagal activity near diagnosis from a 10 second ECG, a simple 10 second ECG, has enough information to tell you what's gonna to happen to these patients. Their tumor burden, in this case, CEA drops a year later if their HIV is higher, independent of treatment and stage. This is in prostate cancer in men. Higher HIV, near diagnosis, lower PSA, lower tumor burden six months later, independent of treatment and stages of cancer. And this is survival in pancreatic cancer. This is a study we did in Brussels. Again, just the 10 second ECG before surgery, higher HIV predicted doubling of survival, doubling of survival in one of the worst cancers, pancreatic cancer. We'll come back to that later. And of course, this effect is independent of all of these confounders. So after statistically controlling for these confounders, still HRV is an independent predictor of lower risk of dying. And this is a study with O Atar. I don't know if O is here. He's probably busy with patients. And O is one of my doctoral students. And he's uh, doing his specialty in, in, clinic, in health psychology, medical psychology in Ichilov Hospital, Tel Aviv. And this is under review now. These are th about 30 patients with lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And you can see the ones with higher HRV, almost five times the chance of living than those with lower HRV. So we're able to predict and to show that higher vagal activity literally predicts longevity in this hard cancer. This is our strongest finding. But it gets even more interesting. I not only look at now at HIV as a predictor, I look at it as a moderator. Anna is not here. She always jokes with me that you psychologists love interactions. Yes, we do. So an interaction is a, an interacting or moderating factor is a variable that changes the effects of another variable on an outcome. So in this study, we had, for example, disease stage. We had uh, their performance. We have their age. Do these factors predict the outcome, disease, uh, survival, differently in low and high HIV? And the answer is yes. So for example, if the, the patient have progressed with their disease, they will all die. Well, they do only when their vagus is not working. 100% of them died, unfortunately. When their HIV is high at baseline, only 30% of them die. 70% of them survive even though they progress to their disease. So the vagus is a moderator. It mitigates, it reduces, it almost cancels the effects of other prognostic factors on, on mortality. I wanna be careful, of course, I don't wanna talk in a causal language. I have to be careful because this is just a correlational study. But the HRV is measured at time one, the survival, of course, at time two. And we keep on finding this result in different kinds of diseases. Higher vagal activity seems to cancel out and to weaken the effects of other prognostic factors. I'll show you this soon. <clears throat> in a study that I did in, uh, that I'm still uh, supervising, my former university in France, where Asaf actually joined me in France and, and he ran away to here and then I ran, I, I, I ran after him to here also. I ran away from France, I'm half joking. Uh, Laura Caton examined together with me in the Dutch Lifelines cohort study, 84,000 Dutch people from the north of Holland. And we have here two people that speak Dutch. And um, 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 these were all people without cancer initially. And they had an ECG. So our inclusion was that they have to have an ECG so we can measure vagal activity and without cancer. We wanted to see whether it predicts cancer. The answer is yes, it does. Higher HIV predicts lower risk of cancer. This is the first study to show this, the beginning of cancer, but only in people over age 40, not in full sample. So after we statistically control for age, it collapses. But when we split the sample in high and low on age, HIV predicts in older people. But we also had a psychological measure called major life events. Now, many people think, like to think that stress is a risk factor of cancer. In fact, the research does not show this. The research does not show this. People have the need to explain, oh, my cancer developed because of my unemployment or because of my daughter or because of my worries. But actually, we need to distinguish between the need to find an explanation 
versus and a meaning versus whether it really is. Okay, and we can calm down people because there's not so much evidence for that. It's not the same with prognosis. Psychological factors play a very important role in prognosis of cancer, but not so much in the etiology. So here we examine, do life events predict, survive, uh, predict getting cancer at the first place? And is it moderated by HRV? And both of the answers are yes. So in this study, we did show that people with higher life events had a higher risk of cancer. The major life events included death of a relative, et cetera. But then what happens when we split the sample into high and low vagal activity? Again, this moderation. Again, major life events predict high risk of cancer only when HIV is low, not when HIV is high. So even in the, in the risk of getting cancer, the, the, when the vagus is working okay, it seems to protect us against adverse things. First of all, it was tumor stage. I showed you before. Now it's life events. This is the master's thesis of Asaf, who is here with us. We call it between us the, the fox. So this was his master's thesis. Um, it's soon going to be submitted. Uh, these were uh, knee, total knee replacement patients. And we looked at their CRP trajectory. So CRP is an inflammatory marker. As you can see, this is a day one after surgery, day two after surgery, and this is actually day four after surgery. It's not number three. It's just our third measure. And you can see the CRP is much higher in the one with low vagal activity because they have less reduction of the inflammation. And I'll explain how the vagus reduces inflammation. This is important because higher CRP is related to more complications, of course. And of course, the vagus is negative related to breathing problems and to complications in COPD. So that was the epidemiological level. What about the biological level? Does the vagus slow down pathophysiological risk factors of disease? So I'm gonna focus on cancer, but the same pathophysiological factors contribute to COPD, to stroke, to heart disease. I'm gonna focus on oxidative stress, inflammation, and sympathetic activity. So for those who are not so strong in oxidative stress, I'm not an expert on it myself also. Basically our electrons are all happy, and our, our molecules are happy and atoms are happy when they have sufficient amount of electrons. But sometimes they miss an electron and so they go and steal it from somebody else. Okay, and if they do that from the DNA, it can make a mutation in the DNA. And if this can happen in a chromosome that is slowing down cell proliferation, it will not slow down cell proliferation and it will start the cancer under some circumstances. So oxidative stress is crucial. And indeed it predicts faster mortality in, in certain cancers. What about inflammation? Inflammation is when it's an excessive immune response to, to a noise signal, to a stressor. It can be an infection, it can be injury. And I always call the inflammation, it's your uncle that's bringing you for Hanukkah, 20 pullovers that you hate. Okay, that's inflammation. It's, it's not doing the suitable and appropriate response. Your uncle has a lot of good, good intentions, but he's bringing in too many presents which you don't like. So I'm just making a metaphor. That's an inflammatory response. And in all of these diseases, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer, diabetes, obesity, and corona, the inflammation is what's killing us. And I'm going to prove you. This is a study done in Ben-Gurion University by Ronnie Apte and his PhD student at the time. 90% of mice develop, develop a metastasis in cancer. But if you block their inflammation, they don't develop metastasis. The cancer does not spread. So the inflammation is crucial in all stages of cancer. What about the sympathetic response? This is a German group that showed incredibly. So 90% so of patients with cancer do not die from the original cancer, die from metastasis, from spreading of the cancer through the bloodstream, to the brain, to the lungs, to the bones. And this is horrible, of course. So our attention should go to preventing metastasis. This German group found that the tumors detach and migrate where? To regions that are rich in a stress hormone, norepinephrine. 
and they were able to reverse this with a drug that none of the nurses here heard of, called beta blocker, right? Nobody of us have heard about it. I'm joking. They used propanolol to reverse the metastasis. When I first read this, I, I was not sure if to cry or to laugh, okay? I'm serious, we just don't talk to each other. We need to take 10 oncologists, 10 cardiologists, and 10 neuroscientists, and just put us in the same building and start talking to each other. Stop with the ego, stop being so childish, kindergarten, I speak. And then we can start saving people if we will start to understand that these problems are very multidisciplinary and require a multifactorial solution in a real way. So imagine you can use a cardiovascular a drug for an oncological problem because of a neuroimmunological process. Okay. What stops oxidative stress? What reduces inflammation? What reduces sympathetic activity? The vagus does that. So the vagus is negatively related to oxidative stress. And the vagus reduces inflammation profoundly. Okay. Most Physicians and biologists and nurses never heard about this. Our students learned this. Okay, look, this is published in Nature and Science. This is not side journals and it's not new. So the vagus informs the brain about inflammation because it has receptors for an, an, an immunological signal called IL-1, interleukin-1. It, basically, it's a, it's a molecule that tells, that communicates between cells saying we have inflammation or it has many, many other functions. I won't go into that. The vagus translates the signal to acetylcholine, its neurotransmitter, and then it activates a negative feedback loop. It activates cortisol to stop inflammation. So if one of you or me have a, a mosquito bite or a, a, a bee stinging us and we go to, and our hand looks like a football, and then we go to emergency room with that, what will they do? They will give us cortisol, but this is not necessary. They can activate the vagus because it will in a natural way activate cortisol to reduce inflammation. Similarly, at the same level, in a parallel fashion, the vagus does reduces inflammation via the spleen. Um, again, if, if I have more time, I'll explain, but basically it does it by, it does not innervate the spleen. It does it via the sympathetic response. It's one of the only places where they work together. And they found T cells that hear this sympathetic signal, and now they produce acetylcholine as if they are the vagus. And they tell these monocytes inside, enough is enough, stop producing inflammation. And so this splenic root and the cortisol root is the way by which the vagus modulates inflammation. It's crucial because almost all chronic diseases and corona exacerbate and get worsened because of inflammation. And in all of these diseases, the vagus nerve is not working enough. And of course, the vagus reduces sympathetic activity because it's parasympathetic. So the vagus could reduce oxidative stress, inflammation, and sympathetic activity. And Asaf and I think that there are a few other uh, um, uh, processes such as uh, hypoxia. By the way, HRV is also positively correlated with telomere length. This is a study. So telomeres are the edges of the chromosomes that are not coding. They're not coding uh, genes, but they protect the chromosomes. And each time the cell divides, they become smaller. So it's an, an index of aging. Well, HRV is related to longer telomeres. This is a study where they actually put people in a stressor and they showed that larger reductions in HRV, which is what happens when we're in stress, were related to shorter telomeres. So people that their vagal activity did not go down so much during stress had longer telomeres, which means longer longevity. What about the biologic, the behavioral way? So people that smoke, people that eat too much uh, cortisol rich food and not enough fruit and vegetables, and that which who don't do physical activity, those people have a worse risk of having these diseases or dying from them. Well, the vagus is here related bidirectionally to them. So each time you smoke, your HIV goes down. 
Heart rate variability is negatively related to obesity. In fact, each time you are doing, for once we're living in the right side of the world, a Mediterranean diet is related to higher HRV. So hummus and olive oil and fish and vegetables and fruit and vegetables and fruit, each time you eat more of these things, actually your HRV eventually goes up. So Mediterranean diet is related to higher vagal activity. Now, as I said to you, vagal activity is related to this frontal region. This frontal regions is related to the capacity to inhibit unhealthy behaviors. So people with higher executive function, which is memory, self-regulation, uh, working memory and inhibition, not only have higher HRV, but they also live healthier, okay? Because it's mediated by the frontal cortex, which is inhibitory, okay? So executive function, this working memory, this uh, capacity to do inhibition is related to lower risk of smoking and diet, uh, poor diet, et cetera. In fact, if I take obese people and you give them biofeedback, which I'll explain soon what it is, vagal biofeedback to increase their vagal activity by simply deep breathing, they want to eat less. And electric vagal nerve stimulation in rats was found to reduce weight of obese rats. So again, vagus is beta directionally related to a healthier lifestyle. And so to summarize this part of the talk, I developed this model to show that we are at low risk of diseases metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer. If our behavior is healthier, we smoke less or we don't smoke, we do more exercise, we eat Mediterranean diet. These things are bidirectionally related to better vagal activity. At the epidemiological level, higher HRV predicts a lower risk of these diseases and a better survivor from them, as I showed you. And I only showed you a small, small fraction of these, disease, these studies. There's meta-analysis of these in stroke, in heart disease, in cancer. At the biological level, the vagus reduces in uh, oxidative stress, reduces inflammation, and reduces sympathetic activity. So it should slow down getting these diseases or dying from them. Okay, so this is our, my neurological model of chronic diseases. What about acute diseases? Well, when COVID started, I did not know, we did not know much about it, and I certainly did not know. Eventually, it became clear that it's a, it's, a, it's a flu, it's an upper respiratory infection, and there's a lot of inflammation. It's called the cytokine storm. So I contacted the Ashkelon Hospital, and I also contacted a group in the Netherlands. The, the Dutch were faster, and we produced data from 271 Dutch patients. We took their 10-second ECG, simple 10-second ECG. By the way, it was a Dutch group in 1997, Decker, that showed that even from these 10 seconds, you can predict survival in the population. And here we looked at COVID. Of course, we considered known factors like age and diabetes and hypertension and heart disease. And we were surprised. Indeed, higher vagal activity is related to a doubling of survival in corona compared to lower vagal activity. And again, we found the moderation. What is one of the most important predictors of death in COVID? Age. Well, again, age strongly predicts more dying only when the vagus is not working. When vagal activity is high, age no longer matters. So higher vagal activity, again, all the time, not only appears as a predictor, but as a moderator, it seems to be a real protector. In different diseases with different measures, and in different prognostic factors. Now, some of you are clinicians, so your clinicians are going to ask me, okay, what can we do about this theory? I'm gonna show some studies on intervention and that will be the last part of my talk. So this is a study done in dogs, unfortunately, in Japan, where they looked at the size of an infarct they actually caused the heart attack to these dogs. 
And this is the size of the infarct in control dogs. They, they, they had an infarct. This is 13% of their left ventricle has myocardial damage. If they stimulated the vagus immediately, zero minutes after the heart attack, the damage went down by 80%, 80%. If they waited an hour and they waited, uh, sorry, an hour and a half, which is similar to people until you decide, did I have a heart attack? Did I not have a heart attack? Is it a stomach ache? Until the ambulance comes, until the, you get to the hospital, maybe I hope it's not 90 minutes, but let's imagine, yes. The damage of the heart went down by 60%, okay? I presented this in Rambam cardiology and they said to me, we don't have, none of our drugs do these things. So, and I'm happy to say, and I'll mention this later, that uh, Riham, who is here, her doctorate is gonna be on this. We're gonna, we're gonna ask, we're now doing the Via de la Rosa of getting the ethics approval. And the Israeli FDA, the Amar, we're gonna stimulate here in the ear vagal nerve activity in patients just arriving to hospital after a myocardial infarction. And we wanna see whether it reduces their infarct size and what is the mechanism? Is it via less inflammation? We're gonna see long, short term and also one year survival. If we get the permission. And Riham is doing an incredible work on, on, on writing the, all the documentation, all that. And I wanna congratulate her for that. And we have very good uh, collaboration with the Benetia Hospital. One way to activate the vagus is by biofeedback. And Asaf, who's here, is really a specialist in this, and he is an amazing trainer in HIV biofeedback. So basically, you connect yourself to a, with your finger or here in the ear to a sensor, and you can you do it with a simple app or with more sophisticated devices that are not so expensive. And you do deep paced, slow breathing. Let's say inhale five, hold two, exhale five or exhale seven, for example. And immediately your HIV goes up within eight, 10, 12 seconds. So this study showed a review, 24 studies showed that you can reduce anxiety and stress just by biofeedback. This is a small study we did with, in France um, with a master student of mine. Some French have daily hassles. This is one of the French men who has a daily hassle. This is Macron. He was in a, a demonstration and somebody slapped him. And two days later, somebody threw an egg on his head. So it's not so safe to be the president of France. So these are his daily hassles. And uh, we randomly assigned these 50 people, adults, to either get three SMSs a day, just simple SMS, to do deep, slow paced breathing for two minutes. I on purpose decided to do it just for two minutes because people say to me, I don't have 20 minutes, it's too long. I don't have 45 minutes. We'll just do two minutes. We wanted to see, does this work? Our controls, the placebo got three SMSs a day about awareness. Stress is not good for you, okay? And a week later, we looked at perceived stress, decision-making and symptoms, and we were amazed. So awareness, of course, there's nothing. And the simple three times a day, two minutes of deep paced breathing reduced levels of stress over a week and also to some extent, but significant physical symptoms. So we can do something about this. Uh, vagal nerve stimulation electrically, this is another stimulus, which we are not gonna get, unfortunately. I would love to use it, but the company, they don't have a representative in Israel, so they don't wanna sell it to us. What a silly reason. Um, these were 133 patients with cluster headache, not, not my study. And they randomly assigned them to placebo stimulation or real vagal stimulation. And you can see the improvement. This is percentage of improvement. Vagal nerve stimulation reduces headaches dramatically. Probably the mechanism is, and I see Roy here, probably the mechanism is by vasodilatation. One of the reasons of headaches are vasoconstriction and also less inflammation. What about cancer? Well, we did a small pilot study and I'm almost finishing. And this is a small study, it's not a good study. We were aiming to get 60 people. And unfortunately, our doctors and patients did not collaborate with us. This was done in Belgium and Brussels. So we asked patients with stage four metastatic cancer to do vagal 
your feedback. With this device, by the way, this particular device, you put your finger inside, you do the deep breathing, and on the screen, you see whether your HIV goes up or not. We ask these patients to do it 20 minutes a day. And unfortunately, after a year and a half, we only had three patients, three patients. So I thought, this is horrible. What, what can I do with three patients? So I asked the, the young oncology uh, resident, please find three patients from the archives that have the same cancer, colon, the same stage, metastatic, and they all, all six got the same chemotherapy. So their medical profile is identical. And they have the same tumor marker level. Each one I matched one-to-one -one on CEA. And remind you, CEA is a simple tumor marker of colon cancer. So they're very similar. Now this is not a randomized trial and it's only three and three. It's just a, a matched control pilot study, but it is matched. And this is what we found. So in orange, you can see the level of the tumor marker only getting chemotherapy and in Bordeaux or red, the chemotherapy plus vagal biofeedback. It's really nicely going down. Of course, this is just three and three. And I'm happy to say, and some of you know, we got from the Agudal Milchama Besartan, the Israeli society for the fight against cancer, the grant to test this in larger sample, and that will be the doctorate of uh, Asaf. Well, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do it on pancreatic cancer patients. Half will get usual care and half will get usual care plus biofeedback. And we're gonna look at tumor size. We're gonna look at the uh, quality of life. We're gonna look at the tumor markers, CA99, survival, and at the combination of survival with quality of life is called quality quality adjusted life years. It's the amount of survival uh, um, weighted by the quality of survival. I think it's the most important outcome in medicine, quality. So conclusion, I hope I was able to, to show you that the Vegas is important, that we should be routinely measuring HRV in the population. And this also requires a lot of medical education because a lot of people still our colleagues, nurses, doctors, biologists don't know what, don't know a lot about the Vegas. And it's, it's very, very uh, tiring, this thing. I, I work with a lot of hospitals and the, the, it's really hard for them to say, oh, I didn't know this. It's very, very hard. It's really it's a demanding work. And this the next few years, the next 10 years, we need to test whether activating the Vegas can actually prevent or treat these terrible diseases. And that will offer a new thing called neuromodulation and neuroimmunology into medicine, also into psychiatry. The limitations of my work is that some of my studies were based only on a 10 second ECG. Uh, in many of our studies, we look at simple inflammation markers like CRP, and we still did not look at the brain, what's happening. So that's my next uh, step. We have a study that's already approved in Rambam, and we're going to be looking at lung cancer patients and looking at their brain activity near diagnosis. In fact, lung cancer patients have a brain scan to see if they have or don't a metastasis. And we're going to look at the brain of those who later, a year later, survived versus the ones who did not survive. Are there differences already at baseline in their brain activity in regions that modulate the immune system and the vagus nerve? That's what we're going to be doing. Uh, so my future directions are really testing the effects of the brain on diseases, testing the effects of different HIV biofeedbacks on in cancer with ASAF and with O. Um, with the, uh, Yosef, who is here, I'm going to be looking at the role of the Vegas in soldiers uh, finishing difficult courses in the army. And we, I'm happy to say that we have amazing collaboration with the, the Navy here in Haifa. And uh, with Riham, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, post-MI, as I said, and maybe with Tamar, we're going to be looking at uh, HIV perfidic and sleep disorders. I'm dying to do a study on diabetes. This has not been done to see whether biofeedback can actually reduce uh, insulin uh, dysregulation. Voila. Well, uh, thank you to many of my collaborators in Israel and in Belgium and the United States and in other countries. And I think I spoke enough, so this is our game of words in Hebrew, uh, Todah